Greetings, friends and comrades. Daniel Tut here, and very excited to open our first session with Dr. Leon Brenner for a three-part workshop, public workshop with our study groups on psychoanalysis and politics, uh, entitled uh, The Politics of Diagnosis. And today, our first session is entitled The Birth of Diagnosis, Foucault's History of Madness. Uh, let me introduce our esteemed workshop uh, presenter, Dr. Leon Brenner. He is a psychoanalytic theorist and psychological counselor from Berlin. Dr. Brenner's work draws from the Freudian and the Lacanian traditions of psychoanalysis, and his interest lies in the understanding of the relationship between culture and psychopathology. His book, The Autistic Subject on the Threshold of Language, is a bestseller in psychology in Springer Publishing in 2021. He is a founder of Lacanian Affinities Berlin and Unconscious Berlin, and he is currently a research fellow at the International Psychoanalytic University of Berlin. Leon, the floor is yours. Um, we are extremely excited. We have up to two hours. We may end a little earlier because it is late in Berlin right now. Um, thank you for coming on to our program, and please take it away. Thank you very much, Daniel. Fantastic introduction, Don. Skillfully, thank you. Uh, so yeah, ha really happy to, to be here. I'm happy uh, we're a nice group here, you know, not too much, not too less. So let's take advantage of this and, and try and have some fun. Uh, I have the topics. We're going to discuss them, but of course, you know, we're not going to discuss everything. So I'm going to follow your lead and see what's more interesting to you. To me, everything is interesting. So uh, everything that I'll, I, I brought here would be interesting. Um, there's the readings. I have some more texts for you that I'll tell Daniel to, uh, I'll let, give that Daniel to upload uh, for next week. And we're going to meet here uh, this week, the next one, and then uh, the following week. Is that going to be enough? Of course not, but that's for the best because you will be left wanting more. And I mean, what is more important than to acquire a desire for knowledge, right? Rather than knowledge. Knowledge is something you can toss, toss away at the end of a session, but desire sticks with you. So we're going to talk about um, diagnosis. And when Daniel and I talked about the, the topic for this um, for this uh, workshop, um, we were speaking a little bit about about this issue. And uh, those of you who are practitioners uh, probably know that many uh, patients let's let's call them that uh, come to the clinic with a demand for a diagnosis, right? Um, particularly, I can say about myself uh, that. Uh, due to the fact that uh, I've been doing research in the uh, domain of, of autism research, um, many people come to me demanding to be diagnosed as being autistic. And there is, um, uh, let's say, um, one must be very careful when dealing with this kind of demand, because on the one hand, well, there might be something uh, very important behind it that one must remain attentive to. Or, and on the other hand, sometimes this demand for a diagnosis is, well, it is a demand. And well, in the Lacanian orientation, a demand uh, that arrives from the analysis must never be, uh, let's say, satisfied. So what to do? And, and this is a question that is very much interesting to me. And the notions that we will engage with in this seminar have something to do with this. So we're going to talk about philosophy, about um, ethics, about politics. And uh, we're going to do that while, at least for me, this question is always going to be posed in the back. What do we do with this? Right, eventually, what, what do we do with this uh, when, 
we are demanded to uh, diagnose. So I'll just briefly say that uh, today we're going to talk about Foucault. And if we're lucky, we'll have time for Derrida, uh, which is a very, very interesting, uh, let's say, a topic here, as Daniel said. Next week, we're going to go into the ethics of psychoanalysis and particularly uh, the, let's say, the Lacanian perspective on diagnosis and its function in the direction of the treatment. So it will be a treat, I think, for, uh, for practitioners, but it will also be very, very interesting uh, for those of you that, well, hopefully, for those of you that don't uh, practice. And then in the last session, we're going to try something. Uh, we're going to try um, discussing Alain Badiou, uh, which is maybe it's he's my favorite philosopher, maybe. Um, why? Because I, I read him. He's like he's he's clear as water for me. I can just read him. I feel um, I feel we sort of write or, or engage with with things in a, in a way that ma makes makes a certain correspondence uh, be felt. And we're going to talk about his, uh, let's say, ethics of subjectivity, uh, what I call a diagnosis on the level of the political. And we're going to, hopefully, you'll have a chance to read uh, one of the chapters that I sent you from his second book uh, on uh, being an event. And uh, there's a particular chapter that we're going to engage with uh, there. So that's generally what's going to happen um, if it was a university lesson i would ask if you have questions and probably you'll have questions about the final assignment but this is not university and we don't have a final assignment so good for us we can just uh we can just start um so yes uh, what we're gonna spend i think the line the lion's share of our time today uh, on is foucault uh, because um, it, it, I think it would be very interesting for us to discuss this particular argument that he presents in uh, his book, uh, The History of Madness, Histoire de la Folie, which was translated two times to English, uh, once, I think in the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, and, and published only partially. So they only choose specific chapters in the book and it's a thinner book. I, I have it in my, in my library uh, behind me. And then it was published again in 2006 in full, right? including the several uh, additions and changes that Foucault would make in this book, as we will see, uh, due to the uh, great dispute that he had with his student, Jacques Derrida, exactly on the subject that uh, we're going to talk about. And just some gossip, you know, uh, Derrida and Foucault were acquainted or even friends, and this dispute really tore their friendship apart. And if I'm not mistaken, those of you that are, are, are more um, savvy as to, as to the, the history of, of philosophers in France, I think one of them was jailed. I think it was Derrida in the Czech Republic and Foucault came and got him out of jail. I think that's the story, if I'm not mistaken. They patched things up uh, where Derrida waited for Foucault to die. And then in his memorial gave him another last punch where he is deep underground and cannot uh, reply in any way. So <laughs> if you want to describe this debate in any way, this is how it went. But we have to start with Foucault. And if there are two things that I might want to uh, say or to, to stress from the beginning as, let's say, goals for us today is uh, one is to, uh, let's say, um, have some uh, access to uh, Foucault's uh, argument about the discourse of psychology what we might say is the discourse of psychoanalysis, but I would completely disagree with this, but let's call it discourse of psychology or psychiatry. And the fact that this discourse is both constitutive and constituted by the category of mental illness. So we'll try to understand how diagnosis and psychiatry are in fact 
interdependent on each other. No one preceded the other. They both came into being together due to some contingent circumstances that Foucault will mark out in his argument that I'll present today. And the second, with the second thing that, that I, I hope we could, could clarify is the fact that um, the object of psychoanalysis has nothing to do with the object of psychology. So in this sense, we're gonna, uh, as Derrida says, do justice to Freud. And we're gonna see uh, uh, how we can get to this uh, particular argument. So thinking about psychology, some of you uh, are psychologists, some of you are studying psychology. Uh, psychology is considered to be a human science. And well, we assume uh, this for now, at least, um, well, that a science uh, well, is something that, um, let's say, I'll put a scare quote, objectively examines a certain object. And I'll say more than this, a science is defined by its object. And an object of science then would be something that we can call a knowledge independent entity in the world, right? So what do I mean with this? Uh, I mean that, uh, let's say for instance, autism, as you know, this is a subject that's very uh, important for me. So if we consider autism in scientific terms, we would consider it as a syndrome that has been affecting humans uh, even before we discovered it. Right. So it's not something that just came out of, of our, us talking about it, but it was something that was there all along. And then because we use scientific tools, we were able to elaborate uh, this uh, syndrome, uh, asking questions like what kind of thing is autism? Uh, is it a physiological, psychological, or a genetic condition? What kind of behaviors distinguish it from other pathologies? And uh, scientists would ask these questions and attempt to determine autism as an object of science. And this would mean being a mental or a physical syndrome that is to be objectively studied and eventually contained. So in other words, um, through the organization of the knowledge and its object, the science of psychology attempts to gain mastery over reality. And in this case, a, a mastery over what is called a mental illness uh, and to find a way to eradicate it, to bring the subject to a normalized state, to a state that is, let's say, not ill anymore. Now, something that we must keep in mind uh, at the outset, before we even read Foucault's very interesting argument, is that psychology or psychiatry, let's say, I'll just use psychology for today. Um, psychology is not the only discourse that takes the human psyche as its object. Um, in the history of, uh, of science or in the, in the history of, of humankind, uh, there are, were other discourses that provided us with knowledge about uh, this object, right? There are some of them that uh, still remain important uh, and really shape the lives of, of millions of people like uh, moralistic or religious approaches to the spirit or the soul, right? These are discourses that try to organize, try to make some sense out of, of the human psyche. And then, you know, in the history of, of humankind, there were other, many other discourses that might have become quite esoteric and lost their grip on the masses, uh, like witchcraft, or, um, you know, there was this whole science of humors. Um, I've just uh, had a talk with, uh, uh, with uh, my friend Jordan Osserman on on his book on circumcision. And he talks about this whole field of science that revolved around circumcision as a cure for, for the uh, mind's maladies. So there were many, many interesting and sometimes uh, quite funny discourses 
about the psyche. And psychology is not the only one. Psychology is the one that is dominant today. It's the one that is uh, considered to be uh, the major player in the field today. But this particular discourse on the psyche was created at a certain point in history. And it got its authority and power in our society at a particular uh, point in time. So you, in order to just imagine how powerful this discourse is, uh, you, you can uh, clearly see that it completely transgresses its own domain. Uh, for instance, uh, it uh, segues into the legal domain. So questions of legality, of punishment, uh, let's say of, of a, a subject that commits a crime, a psychiatrist can come into trial and affect the verdict of the subject, divert the verdict. Uh, and this is due to a psychiatric diagnosis. So we see that diagnosis and the discourse that revolves it is not only uh, prevalent and powerful uh, in the clinic, in the institute, uh, it reaches to many, many other, other fields today and has a huge impact today. Today, we are at least, I'm talking about Western uh, society. We have here many people from the US and uh, I, can, I can say that it's, it's uh, quite similar in, in Germany as well. Uh, psychology, psychiatry is a very influential and powerful discourse uh, today. Now, today we're gonna start a discussion on, let's say, the process or the way that Foucault identifies a process that gave rise to the science of psychology. And in this sense, we're gonna um, explore a perspective um, that argues that this is the end of the of the argument that the subject itself let's say uh, this the, the subject as we know it today in contemporary psychology is in fact an artifact Foucault would say that there is no real subject uh, that the subject is invented in the clinic and even worse, one might say that by coming to the clinic and meeting the analyst, the latter is imposing a specific subjectivity on the patient. In this sense, just justifying and strengthening a certain power relation that exists in the form of an ideology. Now, I think that this argument, some of you might not find it so radical, some of you will, but I think this argument is still uh, alive and, and kicking. Right? There's still, we still owe Foucault some answers and hopefully we'll have some uh, today at the end of our, of our session today. Um, so let's begin, let's begin uh, the journey. Uh, and we begin with the emergence of the anti-psychiatry movement in the 1960s. So this was a movement that came to challenge psychiatry. It came to challenge mainstream psychiatry, particularly as well as psychoanalysis, by challenging exactly this authoritative relationship between doctor and patient on which they were based. And it is important to remember that the anti-psychiatry movement was considered to be radical at the time, but it was also quite pragmatic. Uh, it didn't deny that uh, people are suffering and it didn't uh, want to abolish psychiatry altogether. But the aspiration of this movement was to initiate a new dialogue between uh, the psychiatrist and the one that we call uh, the mentally ill. So it was mostly concerned with the discrimination of certain modes of human existence by psychiatrists. And at the time it was quite relevant, for instance, the fact that homosexuality 
it was then deemed as uh, being deviant and being a mental illness in the 1950s. And we have this movement as a movement that reacts uh, to this problematic, uh, this problematic diagnosis. Now, the anti-psychiatry movement has not died off. Uh, it has many offshoots today, and there's one that's very close to my heart that's called the Neurodiversity Movement. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it. I see you nodding. So, yeah, okay, Matt is nodding, Daniel is nodding. So, okay, so, so you guys know about it in general. Um, it, it is a movement uh, that was founded by autistic people. And basically, um, it progresses a, a, an idea that autism should be described as part of who uh, someone is. So it, it should be described as, a, as through its the sense of selfhood that one acquires through it, it, describing it as a unique part of one's identity and not only as a handicap that should be uh, eradicated. So according to the neurodiversity movements, there are, uh, let's say, uh, neurological variations that are pervasive and all encompassing. And in this sense, they should not be cured. And again, using here scare quotes. And I always give, give these, uh, these uh, quotes from Jim Sinclair and Temple Grandin and their terrific autistic writers and autism advocates. And I'll just give you the quote here on the chat from, from Sinclair. And I'll paste another one from, from Grandin. Let's see. Yes. So uh, for instance, Temple Grandin would say, if I could snap my fingers and be non-autistic, I would not, because then I would be me. Autism is part of who I am. Uh, Jim Sinclair is saying, it is not possible to separate the autism from the person. And if it were possible, the person you'd have left would not be the same person you started with. So this movement is a remnant of the anti-psychiatry movement. And in a way, it is a movement that was domesticated by the uh, neuroscientific discourse. And not for nothing, uh, because it's the most powerful discourse within experimental psychology today. So how do you know that? You ask uh, academics, who gets the money? Yeah. So it's not the psychoanalysts doing research on autism, believe me. It's, uh, it's the scientists doing neuroscientific brain imaging research. This is where the money is. Um, so for, uh, for the uh, for opportunistic uh, folks in the crowd, go and do a neuroscience PhD. Don't waste your time uh, reading uh, Freud and Lacan. But if you, can't, if you can't do otherwise, please do uh, and join us while we do it. So um, generally speaking about this uh, particular movement, uh, which I, I very much uh, support and, and, and feel very much close to, uh, there is a certain point of critique that I do have in terms of its uh, political action. And this is the fact that autism is in fact many times reduced to a notion of one's self-identity. And in psychoanalytic terms, we call this the ego. And the ego, at least for Lacanians, is an object by itself. So in a way, we see here an inadvertent objectification of what we might call subjectivity. Right? So this is just a, a small line for you there that might be interesting uh, for a later debate. So I've, I've presented this movement because this movement was considered to be radical at Foucault's time but not radical enough for Foucault. And there are fields or branches of what we might call identity politics today that sometimes do rely on some reading of Foucault, at least at certain points in, in his uh, career, um, that uh, go, with, go with the uh, sentiment uh, of this movement. Uh, but in a way, um, let's say, uh, only come to problematize something that Foucault, in fact, came to, let's say, um, 
tell us about its future uh, abolishment. Uh, so for Foucault, the question of mental illness, of madness, is a much more radical one. And Foucault then would not belong to this uh, movement of anti-psychiatry, but to another movement that we might call the movement of structuralism in France at the time. And uh, well, there, there are a lot of very interesting, uh, there, there's a nice introduction to structuralism in the Stanford Encyclopedia. And those of you interested, I really recommend reading it. It's, it's well written, but I'll just say that um, a general notion that these thinkers share is that structural linguistics can be applied to the study of social and cultural phenomena. So in this sense, uh, social and cultural phenomena are explained on the basis of their internal structure that uh, makes them possible. So society, subjectivity, they are not substances for structuralists, they are manifestations of structures. And the history of madness, uh, a book that some of you probably read, and I'm sure all of you know, it was written um, as being part of this uh, tradition. And um, what, uh, what, what is interesting about this book is that actually it is, it was Foucault's dissertation uh, that then was reworked into a book. So it's some of the very earliest work that we see from Foucault that later would be developed into his archeology. span uh, So this is the first phase of Foucault's work archaeology of knowledge, and then we see Foucault's genealogy finally coming to his later work, um, which is interesting by itself, but we're definitely not going to talk about uh, today. So in, in the history of madness, uh, Foucault writes about the object of psychology. He writes about madness, uh, which is uh, used there uh, as a general term to designate whatever is excluded from the domain of reason, right? So today we would be tempted maybe to associate madness with schizophrenia, with psychosis, with autism, with delusions, etc. Foucault uses the term madness for Lee to designate anything that might be uh, de determined in opposition to whatever reason is uh, for this particular discourse. So this is why we use uh, the term madness. And what he argues is that one of the main goals in his book is to demonstrate how the uh, psychological discourse gained its authority at a certain point in the history of Western society at the price of the silencing of madness. So this is a bit anti-intuitive because you would think that with psychiatry we finally gave voice to those afflicted with mental illness they were able to say something about it but Foucault's argument is more complex and it turns this sort of commonsensical perspective on its head he says psychiatry is actually the the the, the, the a discourse that really is one of the last nails in the coffins of whatever madness itself is. And this is a very interesting term. Uh, and I quote Foucault, madness itself, right? Because he uses this in his book. And it's a very uh, puzzling term that Derrida had a lot to say about. And I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, it was deleted from the preface after Derrida had criticized on this. But I'll tell you what, what Foucault wanted to do uh, with his book, and you'll see where madness itself fit in, uh, in this re really big and aspirational project. So Foucault writes the history of this silencing. So he, he writes the history of the silencing of madness in the sense that he, he explores historical events and notes, pictures, writings that prescribe something about 
the alienation and exclusion of madness from Western society. So the book is a historical research, one which will be called archaeology. And through this historical research, Foucault attempts to do several things. This is, of course, if you ask me, right? So this is the Reader's Digest. Of course, I'm sure other people have other interpretations. But if you ask me, there are three major projects that unravel in this book. The first is a Foucault's attempt to account for the heterogeneous particular manifestation of madness as an object of discourse in Western society. Right? So this would be the way madness was discussed in Western society and mostly in terms of, let's say, its uh, opposition to, um, para to whatever organizes a paradigm of reason. The second project, and this has to do with madness itself, is to give a voice to madness. And this is very interesting. Foucault wants to explicate something universal about madness itself, something that exceeds the particular objectification of madness in discourse. Right? So it exceeds whatever he will discuss in his first uh, project. This is madness as an un unmediated experience that precedes it ar its articulation in opposition to reason. Now, this goal would be a source of a great and long polemic uh, with Derrida, and hopefully we'll touch on that a little bit. And finally, and this is something that's interesting to me, and uh, yeah, between us, I can tell you Foucault's book inspired a lot of my work on autism and particularly my work on autistic foreclosure, which is a, a mechanism, psychic mechanism, I call it of constitutive exclusion. Right? This is how I call it. And I do a lot of work on it in my book and my publications. And what Foucault, if you ask me, also does in the book is to demonstrate that reason in its many uh, varieties, let's say, in the, history, in the history of Western culture, is a product of the exclusion of madness from the domain of human knowledge. So in this sense, Foucault comes to elaborate a constitutive exclusion uh, that took madness as its object and produced reason uh, through the exclusion of madness. So this is me reading a little bit into Foucault, uh, making him more of a structuralist than he actually is, but why not? You know, we, we, if we, nobody says we're not allowed to do it. So, uh, so maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is just a general summary I'm gonna go into the um, into the discussion now. I'm gonna uh, I mean I'm gonna present briefly present Foucault's argument, Foucault's historical argument in his book, so we can discuss it and say what uh, we think about it. Um, but uh, maybe at this point, uh, if there is anything um, that um, I might uh, I don't know anyone has a, a particular question in terms of. Uh, where we are, or maybe uh, if you don't hear me well or something like that, then it's better you tell me now and then I can proceed. And I also take a sip of my water. Okay, so the Zoom silence of death, but this time it's a good sign. You're, you're with me. Julian. I just have a quick question. Um, yeah. In your overview, you kind of mentioned um, the relationship between the emergence of the anti-psychiatry movement and the kind of changing status of homosexuality, which was uh, viewed as a psychiatric illness. Um, I just, I wasn't totally clear. What was the link you were establishing? Were you saying something like it was the movement toward depathologizing homosexuality that played kind of a constitutive role in 
the emergence of the anti-psychiatry movement or maybe kind of a different relationship between those two movements? Um, maybe, yeah, if you could just clarify a little bit. Yeah, I was not uh, suggesting any kind of causality, but just giving an example of, uh, uh -huh. let's say, some, some of the struggles that these people, the anti-psychiatry movement people at the time were taking on themselves. Uh, this one, I think, is more, um, let's say, uh, known. So uh, I was wanting to, to give some, something familiar to, to you guys, too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good. So thanks, Julian, for that question. So Julian was the brave uh, first one. Now you can ask questions as well, right? This is how it goes. Good. So um, yes. Um, we're going to begin by, by discussing what, what Foucault referred to in terms of the exclusion of madness. And also we're going to see why he viewed it as a contemporary gesture. And if you read Derrida, you'll see it disagrees a bit. And well, in this sense, Foucault, through this, through this argument, tries to disarm um, the presence of the science of psychology uh, as uh, as a science that speaks about a knowledge independent entity in the world, right? So this this would be a major problematization that Foucault would address. Now Foucault begins by describing madness in the Renaissance. Um, I, I have to ask you guys because I'm I'm using this word and we have some uh, Eng native English speakers here. How would you pronounce it? Renaissance or Renaissance? Uh, In American English, it's Renaissance. Renaissance, right? Renaissance. I knew it. I remembered something like that. Yes. So Renaissance. If you wish, <laughs> you know, it's up yes, to you. Yes. I I'll do it. You know, when you go when you go to lectures by French Lacanian psychoanalysts uh, that usually barely know any English. Uh, it, they always read the English words that also exist in French in the French accent, right? So, exclusion, even if it's, if it, they're speaking in English, the exclusion, it's the exclusion. So, I'm just, I just want to use the, the dialect. So, it's Renaissance. 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 It's okay. So, Foucault begins by describing madness in the Renaissance. And, and in the Renaissance, human knowledge uh, at the time, revolves around two things, um, according to Foucault. This is, this is, of course, his historical research. It revolves around religion and nature. So there is the knowledge of God, what we might find in the scriptures or in the miracles uh, that God created, and the knowledge found in the nature that he created. Now, because man is a creation in the image of God, there is part of man that is divine and part of man that is worldly. Um, so there are two aspects here that we have to address in terms of the knowledge that we can acquire, right? So in this sense, there is something that we can know about man. And I'm saying man here in the plural, right? Um, um, again, this is, a just translated from the French. So we can say something, uh, we can know something about man, but there's also something about man that remains godly and hidden. And this is why only God can truly have the full knowledge about human nature. So this is how Foucault describes this relationship at the time. And what Foucault argues, and this is relevant for us, is that at the time, Madness was also considered as an integral part of human nature. And this is basically this is very, very easy to understand because the madman is also one of God's creation. So Foucault says, because of that, the world of the early 17th century, and this is a quote, was strangely hospitable to madness. And Foucault gives us many examples uh, for this kind of hospitality. Uh, he demonstrates that madness was understood actually as a kind of foolishness, not as an illness, uh, as a foolishness, a childish innocence, an innocence that is even closer to nature 
and the animal world than whatever reason or wisdom would be. He gives examples of, of people uh, who were mad, but actually had an integral role in society. For instance, the village fool. And I see, yes, the, the very beautiful example of the ship of fools. And th these are examples that uh, demonstrate that mad people, mad men had a role in society, uh, not only as one to be ridiculed, but as, as a, an integral function uh, in, the, in the working of, of a society. And moreover, Foucault demonstrates that it was actually believed that mad people hold a mystical and, well, even religious qualities. You know, the madman speaks the truth. And I don't know if any of you um, read Game of Thrones, the books. I don't know if you are aware that there was a very exciting announcement today by the author about the next book. So those of you that are fans, go and check it uh, on Google. But anyways, there's, there's a very interesting character in, in the Game of Thrones books, doesn't exist in the, in the show, who's a fool. He is the fool, the king's fool. And he has a very integral role in the plot. Uh, he sees a certain truth that no one else sees. Uh, the problem is that he is mad, so he speaks it in a very strange way. And what the people do, they try to decipher what he tells them in order to gain access to this knowledge. So this is an example uh, I bring uh, for well, this kind of very important role that a madness had in the Renaissance. And this role is due to the fact that madness at the time was considered to have a relationship to a truth about human nature. So Foucault emphasizes this fact means that madness was not fully separated from reason at the time. And particularly, it was not separated from the human quest for knowledge. Uh, he shows that, he shows many documents and, uh, and writings that reveal how fascinated scholars of the, Rena Rena of the Renaissance were uh, with madness and how many things are written about madness in its capacity to reveal these hidden truths about mankind. And well, uh, this is another quote that I'll bring you from Foucault that against the, the common sense of our time, actually at that time it was believed that the madman in his innocent foolishness sees a whole unbroken sphere of man's nature. So this was a mad knowledge about human nature uh, that was considered at the time to harbor the secret nature of man, the dark rage and sterile madness. This is a quote that lurks in the heart of mankind. So according to Foucault, and this is his conclusion, at the time of the Renaissance, madness was socially viewed as another form of reason, what he calls an unreasonable reason or a reasoned unreason. And this kind of reason had a direct access to a difficult hermetic esoteric knowledge about human nature, and it was respected and not intended for curing. Right? So this is what Foucault says about the Renaissance. Now, I will just state a short disclaimer at this point. There are many, 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 many historians that have refuted Foucault's argument about madness in the Renaissance. Many people complaining about his historical research, his, the accuracy, the text that he chooses, the text that he chooses not to engage with, etc. So open Google Scholar, it's full of these, of these papers. Um, nevertheless, 
even if the historical argument is not uh, hermet, uh, how, how would you say, complete, let's say, uh, still I think that there's huge value to this work, huge value to this argument uh, when we think about it um, philosophically and as we will try to do today psychoanalytically. Just short disclaimer. So this was the rena Renaissance, very nice time, it seems, for the mad man. And then comes the classical age. And this is where the societal function of madness starts to drastically change, uh, as Foucault says. And he gives several reasons for this. And two major reasons are what he defines as a geographic and an intellectual exclusion of madness, uh, which followed by its negativized designation uh, as unreason. So the intellectual exclusion is um, is a major is a major argument in uh, in Foucault's book. And this is where um, you might know Foucault reads Descartes, he reads his uh, meditations, and particularly he reads his dream argument and demonstrates in fact that in Foucault's endeavor to achieve some kind of certainty, and Foucault is a, let's say, archetypical example for the classical age kind of thinking, uh, Foucault demonstrates in between that in between his words, we see that Foucault doesn't even consider that mad people have anything to provide him in terms of his argument. So he is very much interested in dreamers and the fact that, you know, we dream sometimes that we sit here in the seminar, but actually we're dreaming. So we can't trust our senses if we want to, let's say, find a certainty in the world, if you want to find certain knowledge, the senses are not enough because sometimes they fool us, you know, sometimes I'm dreaming and I'm not actually here, so just let's toss them aside. But he completely disregards uh, his, uh, the, the function of madness and there's a short paragraph there where he engages with mad people that think that they are made of glass, etc, etc, etc. And he thinks, he says, I'm not even considering that. It's not even part of my argument, basically. And by doing that, Foucault demonstrates that intellectually at the time, madness was already excluded from the endeavor that reason has in acquiring knowledge. Madness has nothing to do with a reasonable argument, according to Foucault reading Descartes. This is just a brief uh, description because we have a lot to cover today. Um, in terms of the geographical exclusion, um, which would be interesting for us because we are a little bit more politically oriented, I would guess, in this workshop. Um, Foucault begins uh, by talking about the story of leprosy. And he says that in the Middle Ages, well, there was this terrible malady that struck Europe, leprosy, and it was dealt with by forming secluded leper colonies. And into these colonies, uh, people who were lepers, let's say, uh, were physically segregated and lost their property and civil rights and were forced to live a life of penance confined to these designated leper houses. This is what happened in the Middle Ages. And after the risk of leprosy was extinguished at the end of the Middle Ages, Foucault says that these spaces just cleared out. And this created a new space, an empty space, into which other forms of life could be excluded. And at the time, Foucault says, these forms of life were those that society had deemed unethical and disorderly. So naturally you would think about the poor, the beggar, the drifter, the criminal, they were all expelled, excluded into these uh, old leper colonies in what Foucault calls the great confinement. And well, this is a time where 
masses uh, of these unproductive people were expelled from society. And uh, well, this unproductiveness was mostly determined in terms of the urbanization and emergence of uh, industrialized society. So we see a clearing out of whoever was not useful for the growth of the newly formed cityscape. And what Foucault emphasizes is, well, the, he emphasizes how these jails inherited the regiments of the leper colonies. And this means they included the close inspection, supervision, and confinement of those excluded uh, into them. Now, here we come to, to our subject, because Foucault says that it is only in that time that madness was only also determined, uh, or let's say put under this unproductiveness title. And the first time in Western history where mad people were systematically confined, and Foucault emphasizes, together with the criminal and the poor. So they were put in the same institutes and suffer the same inflictions, the same supervision, the same inspection and confinement. And well, Foucault says that due to this, um, let's say geographical proximity, the borderline between being mad and being criminal became blurred. And it is only at that time that madness started being addressed as an ethical problem. And if you open literature from that time, you will see that there's a lot of talk about this particular perspective on madness that was equated with anti-social acts like theft and murder. And then when thinking about madness, you see questions starting to rise about personal choices, responsibility, a problematic past. All of these started being asked in relation to madness. And the fact that it was unethical also entailed a punishment. And this is a very um, terrifying part of the book where Foucault presents many accounts of psychological and physical violence that is admitted on the mad uh, alongside uh, the, the criminal and the murderer in these, uh, in these facilities. So I was saying supervision, uh, confinement, inspection, these added to what has become the ethical discourse on madness. It has added another layer uh, where mad people started being investigated scientifically for the first time and a new profile of madness as human abnormality starts being built. So we see new specialized terms that start describing madness as an innate medical problem, a problem that has to be studied and on the basis of the knowledge on the body and the mind to be contained. And this is the first time that madness started being in investigated in this way, elucidated in this way, under scientifically constructed laws. What we might call the birth of the science of psychology. Not yet in these terms. So this is the classical age, but Foucault does not end here. Foucault continues to talk about modern psychology. And he says that there was another radical shift in the societal view of madness that happened in the 19th century. And at this time, madness and criminality started being distinguished. So Foucault remarks that, well, the reason for this was that it was a, a bit too much treating the mad and the criminal uh, at the same time. And in that sense, the less severe forms of madness uh, were reintroduced into society, particularly to being taken care of by their families. So we see 
mad people that were considered to be severely mad being extracted from prisons and shipped into the newly formed mad asylums only designated for the mad while the not so severely uh, mad people were brought back into the realm of the family and the care of the family and this is a time and it's it's very important an important uh, aspect for for my research at least is uh, it, it was a time that instead of referring to the mad man psychiatrists ta started talking about mental illness so what we see is that the madman was once again defined as a subject that at its core wants to be a productive part of society right so one has an illness rather than is rather than is the embodiment of an illness right? so one has madness uh, rather than is mad and we see here madness being relegated to the level of let's say the working of invisible germs for instance and what we see then is that modern psychiatry doesn't come then to investigate mad people but the illnesses that inflict the mind of normative people so mental illness then turns to be the object of psychiatry an object can be, that can be diagnosed objectively and cured. And well, this object is the very object that those of you that study psychology, for instance, um, talk about in your universities. Right? This is the object, the mental illness. Now, according to this new discourse, uh, the discourse on mental illness, um, we see uh, that subjects that are mentally ill are requ required to submit themselves to voluntary psychiatric examination. And they have to do it of their own volition, of course. And this uh, examination would dissect any manifestation of the madness that they have on the basis of a set of normative standards. Uh, today, we call this the DSM. And on the basis of these standards, then the psychiatrist can listen closely to madness, diagnose its origin, and restore uh, the subject to normality. Um, the fact of this voluntary submission is a very interesting one that Foucault will develop later in his thesis of biopower. Um, I think it, it was it was quite uh, interesting to think about this scheme, particularly uh, recently in the past two years, where we had to uh, engage with the question of of the plague, of uh, the COVID pandemic, and the question of uh, governments and their authority over the bodies of subjects, and. To me, uh, this is a very interesting topic. It's not uh, a given. It's something that has to be discussed. But the argument that I arguments that I many times heard by uh, what uh, what we might call people that oppose vaccines, for instance, is that we see here an attempt to control the body, the bodies of citizens. But we have to remember that Foucault's argument about uh, Foucault biopower argument is much more complex because for Foucault this is not this is not an exertion of power at least not power as he deems it for Foucault power is a much more complex thing for Foucault biopower would be exactly these moments of voluntary submission of the body to to the power of let's say um uh, corporations, for instance. For instance, you know, a, a, we, we can uh, buy today a, a, a kind of a digital watch, a computer watch that will tell us how many steps we make every day 
and it might send up a message from time to time to drink a glass of water. And this watch will uh, increase our health. It will uh, improve our health. We will become healthier and probably will suffer from less illness, uh, which is great for us. It's also great for uh, insurance companies uh, because they will need to spend less money on, uh, on medical care. Um, but basically what we see here is a voluntary submission of the body into some set, some order of control. Now, Foucault was uh, very uh, sophisticated when talking about this. Um, first of all, because he says that power in its contemporary form has to be, uh, has to exert itself in an unconscious way, in a way that the subject would consciously say, this is actually for me, this is my choice, and have no access to any, any idea of, of this, uh, let's say, sublimated, this uh, more hidden type of control. Second is that for Foucault, power is not necessarily bad. Power, power can have good or bad aspect. It's not a normative theory then that Foucault is presenting because yes, it is a fact. People are healthier. This might be great. It's not necessarily bad. On the other hand, the fact that the, the exact drink that you drink or the exact state of bodily health uh, is determined by people elsewhere for other reasons than your, than, than your health, this might be bad. This might be something that we might want to criticize. So for Foucault, it's a more complex thing. And we see it already here in the history of madness when he talks about the voluntary submission of the body, of the psyche, into the hands of the uh, psychiatrist. Um, so this is where we are today. According to Foucault, we hadn't, haven't transitioned to what Derrida calls the paradigm of Foucault. So Foucault's paradigm being the one that follows the discourse of mental illness, the discourse of psychiatry. Uh, we might be on the threshold, who knows, but definitely we have to agree that psychiatry, the psych psychiatric discourse, psychology, psychological discourse are the dominant ones today. And this is how we address mental illness today. In our, in our research, we see it as an object that is utterly independent from the practices that investigate it. And we see psychiatrists, and I'm not saying psychiatrists are bad people, not at all. Uh, you know, I always talk about ABA practitioners and autism. I, I, I don't think that ABA practitioners are bad people. Because I think that maybe ABA is extremely problematic for autistic people, but uh, most practitioners are kind of people that want to help. And through their help, they come to treat the illnesses of uh, those that have them and well, open them up, make them visible under the, terminate, the determination of psychiatric diagnosis. Now, Foucault's position is opposite to that. Now, Foucault argues that both the practice of psychiatry and our contemporary understanding of mental illness then, now you see, are interdependently constituted. So for Foucault, there wasn't mental illness before psychiatry. And there was no psychiatry before madness was excluded and defined as mental illness. Now, not only that, Foucault also argues that both psychiatry and our understanding of mental illness came into being due to a variety of preceding heterogeneous cultural and social conditions that concern the institutional treatment of mad people. So this means that they are not a product of this linear progression of scientific achievement, right? And here, Foucault is uh, not Hegelian, I would say. Uh, Foucault 
argues that they originate in contingent social and economic factors. As I've mentioned, some of them like the end of the leprosy epidemic and European industrialization. This is another very radical argument that uh, Foucault makes. Um, now, one of the most important arguments in the book um, emphasizes that our current scientific discourse, and I'll say a little bit about this in terms of episteme, this is a term that appears later in Foucault's work, but let's call this the scientific paradigm uh, in the words of Kuhn, for instance, but Foucault had a words for this, he called this episteme. And for, for Foucault, history is composed of these heterogeneous domains of epistemological domains where knowledge was organized in a certain way. And there are certain breaks in history which separates, separate these epistemes and there is no relationship between them. So we are currently in a particular episteme, in a particular paradigm that we might call the scientific paradigm, one that revolves around a certain notion of rationality, reason. But for Foucault, what we all currently agree upon as being reasonable, being reason, is not a perspective on truth. It is a product of a discourse that revolves around a constant attempt to exclude madness. So in this sense, uh, the knowledge that we gain on the basis of this discourse, and uh, this is for instance, uh, knowledge on the different forms of mental illness like psychosis, schizophrenia, autism, for instance, is nothing but uh, social constructs that attempt to cast away what does not fit with contemporary forms of power and uh, ideology. So in this sense, Foucault's idea of the birth of diagnosis is a very bleak one. Um, and I want to start a discussion at this point, and we'll see where, where we can take it um, in terms of what do we do with it, right? This is, I, I, I said, this is a question that we're gonna ask ourselves. So, okay, uh, what do we, let's start with what do we think about it and then see uh, what, if we have something to say in terms of what uh, do we do with it. Is this the end of, of psychiatry? Let's say an argument, we, we had someone here that uh, investigates Deleuze. So we had Deleuze and Derrida's, and Deleuze and Guattari's schizoanalysis, anti anti-Oedipus thesis, sort of attempt to end psychiatry? Uh, or, uh, well, is, is there a way to be um, hospitable to the suffering of contemporary madness um, without um, objectifying it in this way that Foucault very clearly emphasizes? So, so what do you think? Let's uh, start a quick discussion and see where we can take it. Ray, please. Certainly where I'm located, it can only mean the ends of America and the end of all neo colonies. <laughs> um, I have definitely gained a lot from Foucault and being located in particular on this land, I just feel compelled in the back of my mind to like problematize his influence politically or where some of his ideas come from in particular his uncredited use of knowledge gained from the Black Panthers and Black struggle in the US, um, which to my knowledge, uh, I don't think he pledged any uh, allegiance to. And I haven't gotten all the way through this article that I'm going to link in the comments, but my friend sent it to me recently. And so I have a little bit more research to do on that um, before I really speak with any authoritativeness on the matter. But um, I will say that I do think that 
Um, Soledad Brother by George Jackson is one of the most, um, from what I've read, fantastic elucidations for um, psychological explorations of madness on the side of the oppressor or the colonial subject. Um, and, on, and on the flip side, if you, if you think of spontaneity or commitment to struggle, if you think those entail some form of madness. Um, ooh, I should also reference, I don't know if anyone knows about the SPK Collective, um, Turn Illness into a Weapon in Germany. Um, I, it's been some time since I read it, but, um, but yes, on the flip side, if, if those things are, you know, you think those that in, might entail some form of madness, then for the revolutionary subject as well, there's something crazy going on. But I really love this quote um, by George Jackson. And I will also put it in the comments. What aggressive psychosis impels a man to want his desserts and mine too, to want to feast at every table, to want to cast the shadow over every land. I don't know what they are. Some folks call them devils, doers of evil. I don't know if this is an adequate description. It goes much deeper. From their footprints, I see that they are descendants of Hippocanthropus erectus like ourselves, but here the similarity ends. I refuse to compare myself with a man for one truth will tell 99 lies with a vampire who cannot stand in the sun and do a day's work. And with someone who thrives upon the blood, sweat and tears of any who fall within his power. And so there's more connections to do and I'll probably have more to say on this later, um, like on the topic of what you could call colonial illnesses. Um, and there's also a lot of psychoanalytic excavation to be done in the works of people like Huey P. Newton and George Jackson, and like my favorite artist, Tupac Shakur and, um, and so on. But for now, I'll just like put the references in the comments. Yes, that would be great. And just thank you, Gray, um, for this contribution. And generally speaking, you know, this work from Foucault can be said to, um, let's say, be the precursor for um, fields of study that are quite contemporary today, like MAD studies. Uh, so this is a field of studies that uh, happens in universities today. And also crypt theory, uh, which is uh, another form of, let's say, um, turning, turning uh, uh, like the word uh, queer that attempted to uh, turn uh, uh, to problematize its violent use, the crypt theory tried to uh, problematize the notion of the cripple. Mm -hmm. And these are fields of study today that if you're interested, you can find many papers. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ray. So uh, what else, um, people, do we, uh, should I uh, sell my contract, uh, my rent contract for my clinic, close it up and throw the keys to the, to the ocean. <laughs> Matt, please, let's go. Um, yeah, so this, so like I said, PhD in philosophy work on all this stuff. Um, and I teach now in gender, sexuality, and women's studies, teach queer theory and all that sort of stuff. And the question that has arisen to me over time builds on this question that you're asking, I think directly, which is, Okay, let's say we buy Foucault, whether we do or not, let's just say we do. Um, does the historicizing of this make any difference? It doesn't explain it, even if it explains it, it doesn't mean it's not still a reality for someone. I just finished this book called um, Friendship is a Way of Life, uh, Foucault, AIDS, and Politics of Self-Estrangement or something. And the author continues to take this queer theory line, which is that Foucault hates identity and he wants to get out of the trap of identity. And I'm not, I'm not convinced at this point that that really gets us much, right? Not, uh, yeah, we can critique identity politics all we want, et cetera. But does say, and you know, I, I like uh, any good psychoanalytic thinker, of course, rail really against psychiatry and, and the DSM, but getting rid of the, 
historicizing it and showing its emergence genealogically doesn't rid us of it, right? And so rather than, you know, in addition to just saying problematizing it or denaturalizing it, I wonder as well, you know, what is the upshot of so doing, right? So in a sense, right, let's say, again, we, Foucault is right, or Arnold Davidson makes the same Foucauldian argument about the emergence of sexuality uh, with the sexologists in the 19th century. You know, doing that is intellectually interesting, but my question is sort of pragmatically, what does it do for us, right? So that's just, just in addition to that, more of a question than a, than a response. But if others have thoughts on that, I'd be happy to hear. Matt, exactly. I think I completely agree, and you've put it in be better words than myself. I, I was asking, like, so what do we do with it, right? And this is uh, uh, to make this question even more pressing, right? What does Foucault even provide us in terms of doing something with it? And as Matt says, let's assume that this is true, let's assume that there's this genealogy is, is correct. What do we do with it? This is the question I pass on to you in to this discussion. If no one will talk, I'll, I'll go on talking about Derrida and you'll all be very sorry that I did that. Uh, but, but I have that, we have Daniel here. Yeah, if I may. Um, yeah. I, I don't know about it clinically. I'm excited to see what is developed when we turn to Lacan and we get a clear sense, especially given that Lacan was a major influence on much of the anti-psychiatry of Foucault's contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So already we see um, that interesting uh, dynamic that Lacan would pose a kind of um, problem for them in some ways. However, I am concerned philosophically with the um, embody with the argument that uh, Descartes embodies this radical dualism. And I, I mentioned to you before in reading the Derrida reading, which I know maybe we can talk about next time, um, why is Spinoza not mentioned? I mean, in part because if the, the concept of the void in Descartes is so uh, central, uh, Derrida will say it is, and of course, I think it's extremely useful to remember that in the preface, Foucault um, references Nietzsche and Nietzsche's madness as the inspiration for the adventure of the book, right? Uh, it's very interesting to understand what Nietzsche had to say about Descartes, actually, right? Uh, because nothing in that commentary has actually to do with this uh, with Nietzsche's own uh, position on madness or with his own madness or anything like that. In, in fact, actually, uh, the problem with uh, uh, Descartes and Cartesianism was the problem of the democratization of reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the problem was the um, access to uh, a universality of reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's just quite interesting that um, Foucault's Nietzscheanism is very idiosyncratic, I think, to Foucault, because it's not quite, uh, it's a very strange way to read Nietzsche, in my view. Um, this is not the problem uh, that Descartes, Descartes poses a problem in the same way that Plato and Socrates did, because of the accessibility of, of rationality to, to um, people outside of, of, of uh, the necessary um, uh, caste uh, rank. That, that, that knowledge must be distributed uh, uh, around. So that's one point. And then the other point is I do wonder about, and I'd like to have this conversation later around the legacy of what we might call the fetishization of the mad person in anti-psychiatry. Maybe that's too strong on my part to say that, but I do fear at times we fall into that that there are subjects who are um, undiagnosable, they exceed the kind of logic of the structures in the Freudian sense, and they become, uh, as Foucault said, the kind of 
the, the underbelly of wisdom, the underbelly of a profound mystical insight of civilization, right? And then, and then furthermore, that a new genealogy can be constructed from Hodelin to Nietzsche, whereby, um, and Artaud, right? Uh, whereby the, the mad artist is the kind of last messiah of the resurrection of this sacred knowledge in a certain sense, secular, secular, but sacred. And I'm not sure what that legacy means today in some sense. I, I, that, those are my very broad comments. Thank you. Yes, really fantastic comments. Uh that we should engage with deeply now or later as, as, the, as you wish. Um, I'll just say that, Daniel, I've heard in your, in your um, suggestions a certain, um, a, a partic even an answer uh, to the question that I posed uh, in terms of the pluralization of reason, which is a way to go. It's, it's one way to go, right? Um, reason is not one. So we're not talking about madness as unreason, but madnesses, yes. Uh, as, uh, and in this sense, if reason is pluralized, then we cannot have one universal reason. So every reason is then uh, partial and, uh, and then allows for a certain transgression. So this is one way to, to take it. And also it, it very much uh, um, corresponds with what you've, commented on the fetishization of the mad. And this is something that I think you see very much in Deleuze and Guattari, particularly in their notion of the body without organs, uh, which I, I find extremely interesting, even wrote a paper about, I'll send it, I'll send it to you guys so you can read it. Um, uh, but in terms of looking at the mad person uh, and saying there is some kind of emancipation there. And it is, uh, it is uh, let's say, uh, problematic grounds. Yes, there's a lot to say before we take on that uh, perspective, because in that sense, we are in fact not taking into account the fact that madness also comes with its share of suffering. Basically, this is what psychoanalysis is about, right? The subject suffers and comes to the clinic um, so I think these are very good comments. Uh, Suzanne, maybe you can you can expand on that? Yeah, actually, in line of that thinking or questioning, I was curious more about the relevance and especially the progressive or liberatory le relevance of the neurodivergence movement. I only know it from online and I have two patients who identify as neurodivergent but I don't understand you know the, the goal and I don't know uh, hardly anything about autism so maybe you could elaborate on what I what are the progressive or liberatory potential of neurodivergent and divert, diverting from what? What is the standard that they're diverting from? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll answer this briefly. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. I'll answer this uh, briefly uh, because there's a lot to read online and uh, you can find the papers also on Google Scholar, they're open access. So you can definitely read papers by the leaders of the neurodiversity movement. The diversity and divergence is from typicality, right? So uh, we would say there are neurotypical people, uh, statistically speaking. Uh, maybe uh, Freud would call them neurotic, neurotic subjects. And there are divergences from this typicality. One of these divergences is autism. And in this sense, the movement calls for the recognition uh, equal rights uh, and respect for this kind of a divergence as um, a particular modality of, of, of being human, right? part of the human sequence that has uh, a lot to contribute uh, as well. 
in terms of my work today, let's say I can give you an example that I do work today on the critique of empathy, uh, particularly within the field of autism research. You might know that autism is many times uh, defined as a, an illness that originates in, a, in an empathy dysfunction. This is one of the most prevalent theories today. I go to great lengths to uh, go to, to critique, criticize this perspective, but there is a perspective that is actually promoted by, um, by an autistic uh, researcher. It's called the double empathy problem. And it uh, exemplifies, I think, the sentiment that uh, we see in the neurodiversity movement. Because today we measure empathy. Uh, we, uh, we measure, let's say, neurotypical researchers uh, do experiments with autistic people. And they measure their empathy. They measure their, their capacity to understand what neurotypical people think and what neurotypical people perceive about them in this sense. And the results uh, show that uh, autistic people are really bad at empathizing. Yes. But what uh, Milton empath uh, demonstrates with the double empathy problem is that, uh, well, it is not that only autistic people are hard, uh, difficult to empathize with non-autistic people. It goes the other way around. Non-autistic people have a hard time empathizing with autistic people. They have a hard time reading their minds. So what he says, in fact, we have a, the problem of empathy, the problem of the, the short, short circuit of communication, of empathic communication, uh, is not only on the side of empathy, of, of autism, it is on, the, on both sides. These are two divergent, uh, let's say, I, call, I would say, modes of subjectivity that find it hard to empathize with each other. Uh, so this would be, let's say, a, a product of this kind of thinking in the field of science and autism research that is done in, in psychology departments today. Yeah. Uh, so yes, yeah, some of the work Thank I do Thank you. Yeah, uh, one last little question. So is the neurodivergence actually based on brain imaging or on what kind of test can they so so, so as i as i was that? saying as i was saying uh it's not it's not a completely new form of uh, uh it's not a, a new perspective on on uh, humanity so may, th this perspective has been uh, fostered but in the past even in the anti-psychiatry movement but what uh, distinguishes this particular movement is that it is very much rooted in the neuroscientific discourse. So it's based on research and it, it's mostly based on terminology that has grown in this field, in the field of neuroscience, neuroimaging and neuroscience. Not for nothing, because this is the most prevalent field in autism research. So. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. So I talked too much today, right? Um, I have some more to say. Uh, that's that's terrible. Uh, but I'll just I'll just finish the argument, and and yeah, maybe we'll have maybe we'll have some more time today. Next time I'll I'll try and shut up a bit more. Uh, but Derrida, I don't know if you've read the papers. They are so dense and complex, but have such immense value uh, that yeah we we would have had to have three different sessions only on on Derrida's reply to Foucault. I can briefly summarize or say that the most famous reply from Derrida to Foucault has to do with Descartes. This is the most famous one in in, in philosophy. Every everybody knows it. Everybody that's interested in Foucault and Derrida know knows that Derrida was going really deeply into the Descartes' writings in Latin and really proving and showing that Foucault misread him and actually Descartes was not excluding madness from his endeavor for knowledge. And in this sense, Foucault is wrong in stating that. So uh, this is one of his major arguments, but it goes against the uh, intellectual exclusion that I was telling you about, right? But I think there, there's another aspect to uh, Foucault's argument that 
as a person that is very fond of the structuralist and post-structuralist tradition, I find to be very interesting or the most interesting. And this is where Foucault actually um, refutes the whole historical endeavor that Foucault presents. And in this sense also debunks any kind of idea that Foucault might progress in terms of the importance and singularity of madness. So what Derrida does, and this is just a brief criminal uh, kind of uh, summary, but uh, what Derrida says is that, he says, Foucault, you're, you're actually quite right. Exclusion is a very important aspect in the creation of a paradigm of knowledge. There has to be something excluded in order for there to be a domain that conveys universal meaning. This might remind you of the work of Agamben or uh, this, the more uh, Nazi guy, uh, what's his name, with the state of exception, uh, Schmidt, Schmidt. Yeah. Carl Schmidt, right. So this might remind you their theory. And you can also see this in Lacan, by the way, in his theory on um, masculine jouissance and his idea of the, let's say, uh, the formulas that define it, that define phallic jouissance, the stupid one, yes. Uh, so Derrida says, Deca, uh, Foucault, you looked at this, these historical events and you've identified these exclusions, uh, but actually you're talking about a generic exclusion of a signifier from a domain of signifiers. And Derrida says, well, it's true. Any, any thesis that would be called a knowledge or a paradigm always has an excluded element, but madness itself, it's just an example as a sample. It's not really important. You know, there are many other exclusions uh, in the history of mankind and they all exemplify this same, let's say, discursive necessity. Now, this really, this point of critique really pulls the rug under Foucault's feet. I don't know if you say that. You say that in English? Yeah, so you pull the rug and really pulls the rug under this whole project. Uh, because if the project is only a grammatical intervention, well, it could have been written in a few pages. Uh, it, we don't need this whole uh, idea about madness. And, and what Derrida goes on to say is that, okay, we put this aside, this whole historical thing is, is kind of not working, but also the other goal that Foucault had of letting madness speak something of itself, he said, this doesn't happen in the book. This doesn't happen in the book anywhere because logically speaking, in order to let silence speak or in order to let madness speak outside the confines of reason, which objectifies it and negates it, would entail taking on oneself a language that is completely outside the scope of reason, incomprehensible, irrational. And this is not done in the book and it is for Derrida quite an impossible project. All right, so Derrida would say that madness only speaks for itself in the pathos, in the lyrical, language that Foucault might employ, and he does so beautifully. But he says it's only encapsulated in this pathos. There is nothing to it. So basically, Derrida leaves Foucault with the constitutive exclusion uh, and, well, making it into a grammatical uh, intervention rather than being historic, archaeological, etc. Devastating, devastating critique that I am not sure Foucault was able to save himself from. But he tried. And in the second edition of the book, he added an a, a appendix that, in which he particularly attacks Derrida, uh, I think by name even, if not calling him the philosopher. I think uh, this is how he, 
he calls them there, basically saying, look, these philosophers, they think that everybody, everything is reduced into a logical philosophical formula as though society, history, the event, interesting, he, he uses that, we'll talk about the event in two weeks, as though the event can be reduced into any type of philosophical universe, universal knowledge, and it was very, very brutal uh, retort. Another interesting aspect is that Foucault deletes from the preface these parts where he promises that madness itself is gonna say something. So that's interesting. It's because he, he sort of gives up on it. But I must say that from a psychoanalytic perspective or as a psychoanalyst or a psychoanalytic theorist, the fact that Foucault pushed himself away from philosophy or away from the singularity of madness itself is quite disappointing. I mean, for me, this is important. This, this, is, this is something that uh, marks out Foucault's project in comparison to other, let's say, analytical attempts to say something about ex the exclusion that is important for every paradigm uh, of knowledge. And for me, it is quite unfortunate that Foucault takes a step away from philosophy in the end. But, and I'll end with this, there is this paper to do justice to Freud. Did, did anyone pick this one up? No, okay, you have it, you have it in, your, uh, in your little toolkit. You can read it. Uh, and this is the paper Derrida gave after Foucault was dead. So it was given in one of the memorial events for Foucault. And I'll, I'll just briefly tell you what Derrida says there. It's very interesting and, and also relevant for our talk next week. Um, and then I'll go to stress my final point, the one that I promised I will do, right? Uh, to sort of insist that the object of psychoanalysis has nothing to do with the object of psychiatry. Um, so there is um, a paragraph in Foucault's book, and I'm going to post it here. Such a good paragraph. Uh, and I have to say that Foucault, when he writes about Freud, he is all over the place. Uh, at one point, he loves him. At the other point, he is the devil. At the other point, he is like Nietzsche. He is like these crazy poets. Uh, and then at another time, he is like the warden in a prison. So Foucault is very much unclear as to what he thinks about Freud. Later on, he will only hate Freud. But in this particular book, you see several ways. And, and here is a quote. Foucault says, Freud went back to madness at the level of its language. And here, the Lacanians among you, your eyes must open but very wide right now, right? So Foucault says, Freud went back to madness at the level of its language, reconstituted one of the essential elements of an experience uh, reduced to silence by positivism. He did not make a major addition to the list of psychological treatments for madness, we might say diagnoses, etc. He restored in medical thought the possibility of a dialogue with unreason. It is not psychology that is involved in psychoanalysis, but precisely an experience of unreasoning that it has been psychology's meaning in the modern world to mask. Wow, uh, this is uh, something to tattoo on your arm. I don't know, it's, it's very inspiring. It's, it's, it's very inspiring and very strong. And Derrida calls his paper to do justice to Freud, which uh, Foucault uses just before this quote. Yeah. Uh, what he says basically is that Foucault didn't do justice to Freud because Freud, in fact, the paradigm of psychoanalysis is the one that conditioned the radical subversive nature of Foucault's project in the first place. And Derrida says, Foucault, you didn't acknowledge that enough, except for here in this paragraph. 
and he goes on to show how there is a certain hospitality to madness that is um, relevant both for Foucault and for Freud and for Derrida. So it is a point of convergence between the three thinkers. It's a very interesting paper that I, I suggest uh, you read. In terms of the object of psychoanalysis, right? I've, I've previously told you that we define a science um, by its object. And what Foucault argues here in this paragraph, which I very much agree with, is that the object of psychoanalysis has nothing to do with the object of psychology. And I think, and this is, and I, I borrow this from Veronique Vorous, uh, her idea here on, on psychoanalytic training on psychoanalytic formation. And it is the idea that psychoanalysis is not a discourse that is supposed to provide mastery over reality. What uh, psychoanalysis is, is a discourse that is a product of the experience of unreason. So this is why one does not become an analyst by acquiring knowledge on the object of psychoanalysis. Right? So you go to university, you learn about, well, the object of psychoanalysis, which for Freud was, of course, who's gonna save us? What, what was the object for psycho, of psychoanalysis for Freud? Hysteria? Oh, that, that was a, a subject uh, from, and by listening to the discourse of the subject, Freud was able to say something about the object of psychoanalysis. But what is it? Malisa, I saw you unmuting. Uh, the unconscious. Very great, excellent. Precisely. Well, this is what I think at least. So, uh, you know, we don't become, one does not become an analyst by going to university and learning about the unconscious one becomes an analyst by becoming familiar with the object of psychoanalysis. And one becomes familiar with this object in analysis. So uh, we see that no theory of the unconscious would put one with a familiarity with regard to it. And this is exactly because the unconscious is a heterogeneous body. It's a foreign body in a world that is organized uh, by science. And this is what Veronique Vorhoos says, that this makes psychoanalysis to be a foreign discourse to discourses that seek to provide mastery over reality, and also why there's so much resistance to psychoanalysis within the scientific world today exactly because psychoanalysis is a discourse that does not attempt to domesticate the, let's say, the, uh, the, uh, the heterogeneity, uh, the movement, uh, the flow of its object. It goes against uh, this idea that we find uh, in science, and this we, we might say, and this is what Lacan says at a certain point, the delusion that organizes science. The idea that nature is written in language. So what we see is that against this scientific perspective, uh, psychoanalysis provides an experience of a particular form of suffering, what Lacan would call the real, uh, what would be a familiarity with, with the heterogeny that disturbs, disrupts exactly this discourse of reason. And this heterogeneity, this disruption, this familiarity is exactly what Foucault, I think, in his work had called madness. And in this sense, I think that we can do justice to Foucault, uh, hopefully in a paper that 
I'll publish soon also. This, uh, uh, this is what I, I try to suggest by thinking about, rethinking about madness from within the confines of psychoanalytic ethics. And this is what we're gonna do next week. We're gonna see how this particular kind of sensitivity, hospitality to madness can be embedded uh, in the psychoanalytic treatment. That's what uh, Freud called the cure. And in French, la cure is a much better way to, to call it. So this is what we're going to go do next week, and uh, we're going to end now because we're already way overdue. And uh, if you, uh, well, Daniel, will we uh, send anybody, everybody's suggestions on what to read? Is that going to be possible? Sure. Yeah. If you'd okay. like to prepare a message with the additional PDF, I can uh, attach it to the folder and then share the message, and then I'll also just encourage you to um unfortunately have to re-register for the zoom it's totally free oh. uh but i'll send out that link as well okay but absolutely over email you can just expect an email from me in the next couple of days okay fantastic yeah i think julian has a comment or question uh, is it okay to ask a quick question still or should i say yeah. that I, i'm not promising i'll answer it but... <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh yeah i'm just wondering about I mean, the status of like the contingency of this unreason that is the object of, of Freud's investigation in the form of the unconscious, um, that has a certain inseparable relationship to the modern regime of reason that excludes this unreason from it, leads me to wonder what in Foucault's terms madness might be, I mean, does it not just become a kind of substance? Uh, yeah, there's a certain relationship between like contingency and structure here that, um, yeah, maybe this is too big of a question to um, to ask, but that seems there's something in, uh, paradoxical here for me. Um, how could it, yes. how could unreason exist outside of the modern regime of reason? I very much agree with you, Julian. Uh, there's a paper by Jonas that engages with this question particularly, but basically, you know, the fact that madness as unreason sort of jumps between these paradigms of reason, let's say classic modern, says there, there, there is something that persists in this antag antagonism, in this antagonism that persists from the outside. So there's something that is in a way universal. So Foucault in a way implicitly argues that there is something I don't know if substance is, is the way to call it, but there is something that must be accounted to, um, uh, accounted for uh, in both these places. So in this sense, it survives the, the split, it survives the, the cut, right? Um, yes, psychoanalysis is humble enough in addressing it in its contemporary form, right? Addressing it, not objectifying it, uh, and allowing an experience of it. In Lacanian psychoanalysis, the experience will give birth to something unique, something singular. For Freud, it will bring you to the, uh, to the uh, wall of the castration complex. Uh, so there are many ways to, to look at it. But let's talk about this next week. Thank okay. you all for coming. Thank yes, you thank you, Leon. Thank you yeah. so much. This was a brilliant tour de force. And I'm already just, I can't wait for next week. Really, really excellent stuff. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. And yeah, email me with any questions on logistics. Thank okay. you all so much. Good. See you, Be well. see you next week. Goodbye. Thanks,